Germany, Paul Finn is one of the preeminent, if not, I'll let him do this bit, he's easily one of the most preeminent Wing Chun teachers uh, I know, right? And um, we're actually going to start off there. Where did you first start training martial arts? Okay, thanks, mate. Um, started at school when I was 12, started in judo, like so many people in the UK, I guess. Um, by the time I was 15, I started in Shotokan Karate. Right. Again, they were the only things that were around at that time. Yeah. And um, God rest his soul, um, trained with uh, Sensei Ray Fuller. A few people know about right, Sensei yeah. Ray Fuller, so yeah. that really toughened me up and I needed yeah, that at that time. Yeah, yeah. old school, yeah, right? Yeah, old school. Um, and then I was training in judo with a guy called uh, Seiji Morioka, and Seiji Morioka is still alive. And I did uh, kendo with him and kenjutsu. And the really strange is. thing is, um, Seiji Morioka, who is now I think about 89, when I last saw him about two months ago, we realised that his cousin was the guy, is it Mieda Sensei? Who, Mieda Sensei. Who went to Brazil. Brazil That's yeah. his cousin, yeah. You're joking me, no, really? Yeah. Maeda was a bad ass man. He, he, was, like, he was the hammer. He, Kano sent him over. To, to prove to the world what was going down. Yeah. Wow. Now yeah, Se Seiji Morioka is a sixth or seventh degree Kodakan black belt. And did you enjoy, the, oh, don't mind me, cause I, I've only met a few guys who do kendo. D did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I like the uh, kenjutsu more than I like the kendo. I, uh, the sporting side of it was, was okay, but I was more interested in the art, really. Yeah? Yeah. So tell us about the kenjutsu, what did that... In, in a lot of kata, a lot of um, just one-on-one, uh, -on -one. Uh, you know, you do a cut, they do a cut, thousands of repetitions, just drawing a blade. We spent a lot of time just drawing a live blade and not cutting your own fingers, which is but quite... Uh, I'll I tell you something I saw, at the, I was competing at the London Open years ago. Okay. And so basically, you, you know, if you've ever been to a karate tournament, it's Junzuki, Gakazuki, yeah, absolutely. or Washigeri, that's yeah. it, right? So, and all I had was this. I just, and I had a very unstellar career, by the way. Uh, <laughs> very, very unstellar career. Uh, but I, I used to love watching the kata. Nowadays you watch it and it's like the Power Rangers. Mm -hmm. And I've got friends of mine who teach that and it's an, I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a martial art, but I, yeah, me personally, but I think it's very good. And you know, if you've got kid, kids who are overweight and yeah, stuff, absolutely. I think it's awesome, right? Yeah. But there was this one guy who did this kata and basically he got up, he drew a sword, once in the air and then put it back in and in my naivety and ignorance i was like this going what was that mm. and then i didn't realize there's this whole zen thing yeah, that goes sure. with yeah, it right yeah, absolutely and did you enjoy yeah i did i found i found it very yeah zen like absolutely hey now we're talking yeah. so how did you get into the inno santo blend of martial arts wow because okay. i don't know this okay so i think we we're talking earlier with will here for Wuma tv that's how we do these links, guys. Okay, and Will was talking about the Way of the Warrior series, which was on BBC. Yeah. I think it's 1984. Uh, they showed Simon Lau doing right. Wing Chun in North London. And at the time I was doing karate, and I suddenly looked at the Wing Chun and thought, I need to be doing that now. Right. And so I went and sought out. I couldn't get to Simon Lau. It was too far away. I was still at school. So I started training with whoever I could find in Wing Chun. And then gradually through the Wing Chun, I ended, long story, but I ended up with a guy called Steve Mayer. Yeah. And Steve Mayer was doing Wing Chun, but like Sifu Francis Fong, who's interviewed on Wuma TV. So see that interview with Mick. Um, Steve was cross training. Yeah. And he started training with the JKD guys in the UK. Yeah. Uh, Terry Barnett, yes. Bob Breen. And Steve went out and stayed some time with our, our instructor, our mutual instructor, Rick Fay in Minnesota. Yes. And he stayed out there a couple of months, I think. And then when he came back, he, uh, he dropped the bombshell on the Wing Chun group. He basically said, I'm going to live in Denmark, guys, and I'm going next week. Wow. And we were like, okay, what do we do? That's, that's not like a martial artist just to just... Yeah, he just went. <laughs> yeah, he went. Oh, I'm, being, I'm being ironic here, right? <laughs> and so I went and found um, Sensei or Sifu or whatever we want to call him, but Ralph Jones. Yeah, well, uh, now, now you mentioned him, right? Uh, Ralph 
is literally one of the loveliest men oh, I know. Fantastic, one of my best friends, super nice guy, brilliant martial artist. Yeah, we, at the, I saw him at the last JKD tribe gathering. Okay. And we get there, and I can say this on camera because Bob said it when we interviewed him for Woma TV. There you are, right? Uh, Bob came up to me and he says, uh, you take the warm-up then? And I was like, what? And he says, you take the warm-up. And I, you know, and I can say this on camera now, first of all, there is no way somebody like me should be taking a warm-up. You know, that's like opening for Led Zeppelin, <laughs> right? Yeah? And you're, you're like a karaoke singer. Sure. So Bob's like, you do the warm-up. And I went, uh, I don't know. And he went, look, I'll give you a shot at the title. But the first guy up yeah. was Ralph. Okay. So Ralph got up. And Ralph tore, and I just, he blew, I thought he blew everybody away. And I think he did. I hope he did. If he didn't blow you away, you just didn't get it. No, well, the thing was, Ralph didn't realise, and Ralph didn't realise, because I pretty much pounced on him immediately. Uh, and again, you know, I, I just love, uh, as a person, you, know, you take away all of his skills. Super nice guy. As a person, he is like a coral belt. So, you know, and again... We're not at school anymore, sure. so we shouldn't really be judging people on physically if they're no, better yeah, yeah. or worse, right? So, but as a person, he is a coral belt in being a good person, yeah, right? Totally nice. So guy. he he comes off and like I literally just jump on him and just tell him how awesome it was and well wow, you were great. Good. And he went, you don't know how much that means to me. And I was like, uh, wait a minute, you're Alf Jones, and he's like, yeah, but and he went, but you're McTully, and I was like, no. And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm just going to put it on camera here. Ralph has no real, well, I don't know if he understands or he cares, or I, I don't know if he appreciates just how highly respected he is and thought of by people who know him. And my only criticism is that not enough people know him. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, again, it's another thing with yourself. You don't like actively going out. No, I would. Yourself. I would Absolutely, Mick. PR and self-promotion is not my thing. Yeah, but what, what it is, is this is going to link me back into something now, right? Which mm. is, you started in the wing churn. Yep. That fortuitously brings you into the world. In the centre. In the centre. Yep. And Rick Faye and the yep. Minnesota Cardi yep. group. Yep. And Mark McFan. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Uncle Mark. <laughs> if we could get, I tell you what, I don't want to go to Arkansas, but I will. For you, Mark. I've right? been to Arkansas. It's definitely worth a trip. Yeah, exciting, it's, interesting it, place, Mark. It's America, right? It's America. But anyway, sorry, Mark. Uh, but if you're representing all of these guys, yeah. and we, what we'll do is we'll go back in, in a minute okay. and get you to tell us how it all happened. But when you're representing something so huge sure. and something so good, it's like selling Rolls Royces and then saying, "Do you know what?" I shouldn't really have a car dealership on the on the on the on the high street. Yeah, I know what you're when I put it in that mm. perspective, do you know no, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And what is that just a personal thing, or? I suppose the thing is, at the moment, a bit like yourself, um, I've got a, a career, uh, a sort of day job, as it were. I'm a I'm a lawyer. I'm a partner in a legal top 500 firm, so I don't have the time to devote to the teaching. So the most of the time I get, I spend for my own training. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose devoting time to developing a successful commercial martial art school has always been in the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no, no, you, you've said this because I have this a lot where people say to me, so you still have, you still have your plastering business? Yeah, sure. Uh, but why? Mm. And first of all, it's, I have full-time bills. Yeah. And we all I don't have full-time bills. Yeah, and I don't want to rely on part-time money for a sure, full-time sure, bill, right? Sure, yeah. But more importantly, I've had people say, "Why don't you follow the dream?" Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. All right, I, t I teach a lot of it. I teach a lot of seminars. I do quite well at, in that. But then people say, "Why don't you follow the dream?" And remember, we had this spate for years in martial arts where you had, if you're a martial artist, you're a life coach. Yeah. Yeah, and you had it right, and it, yeah, I've had and it and you taught NLP and you know, exactly all that stuff, right. Yeah. Okay, I taught. I, I did NLP right, and do you know why? Because there was a small percentage of people I did business with that I couldn't connect with. Right. And I just couldn't work out. Sure. And it cost me £4,000, but trust me, I've made that about 20 times over. Mm. And they were all kinesthetic people who would yeah. say, yeah, but you never stay in touch. Sure. And I was like, a visual guy said, look, yeah. listen. And they were like, you're not speaking my language, yeah, right? Yeah. But they, you had all these guys that were doing this and they'd always say to me, 
you should follow your dreams. And I was like, maybe your life is a nightmare, mm. but I, I'm pre I've got a pretty dream existence mm. as it is, right? Mm. Mm. So I'm going to go back now to this. You mentioned earlier about your day job, right? Yeah, sure. So how can you reconcile? So you're in this, you're in this industry, right? So you're in this industry. So how do you reconcile being like this, like feral, animalistic, bloodthirsty creature, and the martial artist at the same time? <laughs> you know that? That was a good one, wasn't it? Hey? Yeah. For a long time. I show. saw that coming. Yeah, I was yeah. way off. I, I was going to hide it, but I think the martial arts and and the day job. Are a nice yin and yang balance. Not not being, you know, too dramatic about it, but the martial arts is a very useful way to de-stress from what can be a very stressful profession. Well, yeah, yeah, now th th this is something that I I really believe in, right? And it's one of the reasons why I really like drills-based training. Sure. Because both of you win. Yeah. And if you understand, if, if you're a good pad holder, mm -hmm. you understand because the first salute, first way of solving any problem is realizing you've got one, right? Of course. And you're in like the only time ever where someone's going to throw a kick at you, you're not going to get hurt and you can actually see the mechanics behind mm. it. But most people don't. They just get into sure. this survival mode sure. and do this stuff. But the reason I like it is both of you get to win. But secondly, because you're de-stressing, uh, and this is something that doesn't get addressed a lot, I think, in everyday life. Uh, I want your thoughts on it. We are still very primal animals in a digital oh, age. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And we can try and rationalise mm -hmm. our way out of it, but it's that's why the UFC is huge, because it's just bread and circuses. Sure. You get guys to come to train with you to de-stress, to learn the art. Bear in mind, I, I, it's a loaded question, because I know some of the guys who sure, train with you. Sure. I think, I think the people that are attracted to train with me on the whole, by and large, are possibly, you know, we get a cross-section of people. We get young people who just want to come and hit pads. You get um, older professional people who are more interested in the intellectual side of things. And, you know, going back to the Wing Chun that we were talking about, uh, and Carly as well, they're much more intellectual arts. There's a lot of drills-based stuff. There's complex technique. It's not just you know, crashing in and hitting pads. So for those kind of people, they want that. But yeah, it's a broad section of people. Um, we're not a fight school, so I don't train any professional fighters. Um, we're not a full-time school. We don't, we don't cater for that. And I think I was talking to Sifu uh, Fong earlier, and we were saying that, you know, and I'm sure you agree, Mick, when you, when you have guys you're trying to train who are fighters, they can often disrupt the whole integrity of the group that are building each other because they've got selfish goals they just want to win and it's for them at the cost of everybody else in the group i've i've trained guys for the ring yep the cage sure i help i help but yeah i, I still compete in jiu-jitsu and believe it or not i it, i don't get i can't get it anymore i can't be selfish mm. you know literally i i compete and i think i've told you this I compete because I'm scared of my jiu-jitsu coach. <laughs> Neil Simpkin, and I, it's the truth. I'm more scared of Neil Simpkin than anybody that I go up in front of. And, I, you know, like literally, I will go out and win a gold medal because I don't want him to beat me up because I see him three times a week. This guy I only see for five minutes, so I only have to <laughs> run through him and that's it. But you, you've, you've hit on something which I've said so many times before. If you want to build a business and you want to bring harmony and... Uh, as Guru Dan used to say, cultural appreciation and social cohesion and stuff, right? You can't get these guys in because, you know, and it's admirable and I know that they're working out their stuff and, you know, whatever they want to get, a big car or I don't know. But fighters by their very nature fight. I had a guy that I, <laughs> I won't mention you, but if you're watching, you know who you are. I cornered a guy to a European title, Okay. right? And I had to almost fight him in the car park at the end of the show for my cut. Wow. Because he was doing me a favour because it made it, me look good teaching him. And I was like, you fighters fight everything. But then when you look at it, most fighters, like, okay, in there you're great, but the rest of your life isn't great. Sure. Because you don't switch that off. Sure. And when you're saying the yin and the yang, yep. if you're a fighter, you fight everything. Yep. Every fighter I know, has no money in his bank account. Sure. He always waits for the red letter to arrive. And they, they, and they, they fly by the seat of their pants, mm. these guys. Mm. And again, it's one 
it, it, it is the whole yin and yang. This is where you go mm. so far into getting good that you don't work the other part of your game, right? Sure. We mentioned... Uh, Just before we go on, Mick, yeah? um, Rick Fay again, one of our mutual uh, instructors, so the man. the man, he says martial art is this huge thing and only part of it is about fighting. So much of it is about self-development, cultural awareness. You mentioned Guru Dan in the Santo. We we're talking to Sifu Francis Fong earlier. A lot of it is understanding culture, tradition, technical stuff. Fighting is is the sort of byproduct almost. But unfortunately, we live in a media-based society. People want excitement, as you said, circus. They want to see blood on the canvas. People are paying to watch fights. So the thing that interests the public is is, is the is the show of it. But I'm, you know, that's not where I'm at and that's not where I think the majority of my students are interested. We're trying to appeal to a much broader sense of thinking public. Well, you, you, you know, you've just said something there, which is the truth. It's this cultural appreciation, right? It's once you appreciate a culture, when you learn something about somebody and you understand it, once you understand where somebody comes from, sure. then you, you know, it's that whole walk a mile in your shoes. And I'll, a classroom is a microcosm for the world. When you walk in there, you will get people from all over the world. So if you train with that, you train, go and train with Rick Fay, go and train with Sifu Francis Fong. Sure. You go there and all of these people come together that you would never meet. So you've got friendships that now go from one continent to another. Yeah, absolutely. That are intergenerational. Yeah. That, uh, you know, you'll be training with some guy and 90% of what he is about, you may not like. Sure. But the 10% that he does, and you just focus on that. Yeah. You know, and it, it really brings it all together. And like, when we're talking about cultural appreciation, uh, I have to talk about the one guy who really taught me cultural appreciation about guns and that's mark mcfan absolutely where did you meet this character first wow um i think to be honest with you it's a long story but i got put in touch with mark mcfan by um the late great pat davis awesome yeah, yeah. great guy yeah, amazing guy wonderful. i didn't know pat very well but he contacted me out of the blue and said mark was in the country would I like to train with him? Would we like to host him? And to be honest with you, at first I was slightly nervous about that. Well, when was Because this? I'd never trained with him before. What year was this? So where are we now? We're 2016. I would say we're talking about 2000. Right, because one of the first times that we came down to support you, myself yeah. and Al Pizzo, Yeah. Do you know when that was? 2004. Or probably. I think that was the third time we had Mark. So really? I think 2001 we yeah, started. Yeah, that was Mark. when Mark McFan turned around to me and I turned up and I had some knee pads on me. I remember this. I had some Henzo Gracie had shorts some Henzo Gracie on me. Shorts. And I had a CSW yeah, t-shirt on me. It. Do you remember yeah. what he said to me? He says, wearing that get up, I hope you're good. And I said, trust me, I'm not. <laughs> and it, that, was, that was exactly yeah. what I said, right? Yeah. Uh, but Mark's Mark is one, he truly is a yin and yang character because Absolutely. The, 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 you know, where does the Monday mood at? You know, when people, what, what I always say when people say, Silla, oh, it's very flowery. And I'm like, have you ever met Mark McFan? Sure. I'd like you to meet him and say that it's a florist because the, he's a legit. Absolutely. Speaker. If you've not trained with Mark and you've not trained with Mark in Silla, if you get the opportunity, do it because it's incredible, it's so functional, it's amazing. But Mark, Mark spent a lot of time with one-on-one -on -one with the late, great Herman Sawanda. He did, he did indeed, yes. Uh, so Mark's, Mark's unbelievable because he was, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was one of the first of the big guns from the Inno Santo family to just, he was training with Mark Lehman in BJJ, yeah. and he's, he just went down the MMA route. And on paper, I would, he wouldn't have been the guy because it was like, you know, the, the Silat, mm -hmm. I, you know, but the, you know, it, it's, it's funny because when you first meet him, and I was like, yeah, he's awesome, he's awesome. And then I started hearing these stories of the UFA test and, 
you know, the Richardson boys were telling me it was like 38 rounds of sparring. Yeah, and the Thai test is bad, right? Yeah, Arjan Chai's test is bad, but that's two rounds, you know? And all right, that, yeah, trust me, I don't want to be in 38 car crashes, but I don't <laughs> want to be in two car crashes either. I don't want to be, but Mark's one of those guys that he's like, if you're in, this is how you train. But then I've trained with him when he's done the Silla, and it's just, it's a beauty to behold, yeah. right? Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy, amazing martial artist. Um, if you're watching this, Mark, you're out there, but you, you, you've got the, he's got the stuff. He's you better believe it. I'll tell you, so, and I, I, I've got this theory that Mark's one of those guys that, you know, you see in the movies where, you know, like Lawrence Fishburne, where it's turned around and we go, we need to turn this guy into a killer, you know, in the Matrix. So they put him in there, load jujitsu in into his brain. And I think that's what you do because... If you've ever seen the movie The Sniper, is it The Sniper, The Shooter? The With Mark, Shooter. Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg, yeah. You know, but that's I, Mark McFan. I always thought that Mark McFan was more uh, Tommy Lee Jones in The Hunted. Yeah, you're probably right that's, there as that's well. What, that's what I've always thought. He goes across many genres. He certainly does, he certainly does. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. And what, what was, you know, was it the Mandy Muda that he came to you first for? Yeah, I mean, you probably know this uh, Mick, but I, tr I was lucky enough to train again out of chance um, with Ibu Rita Sawanda. Yeah. So Ibu Suita Sawanda is the head of the Mandimuda system. Um, when her late brother died, Herman Sawanda, she took over head of the system, which is unusual because she's a woman. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky enough to get Ibu to come to the UK. And I think she came to the UK about 10 years in a row. She'd come and stay with me and my family at our family home. She'd stay normally for 10 days. We'd train every day in Mandimuda and we'd have one or two seminars each time she came. And then there were some problems with Ibu getting into the UK and and I was speaking to Mark and Mark had experience in Mandemuda and so I wanted to, to progress in, in my CELAT and Mark was the logical choice and once you've seen Mark CELAT as Mick was saying you know that is the, the right choice. Yeah well I famously uh, if you've ever done a seminar with me and we've ever done any like I, trust me I've, I know that much, right? Uh, some of the Rikasan. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what sure. happens? So what happens? I'm impressed, mate. Hey. So we go in there, and literally, Mark says, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, I, I don't know. What? What?" And he says, "Have you ever heard of Rikasan? Rikasan Silla?" And I said, "What is it?" And he went, "It's bone breaking Silla." And I went, I, 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 "That sounds good to me." <laughs> so it, what happened was. I went and trained with him, uh, with another of our mutual friends, another killer, uh, Ewan Campbell. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Ewan Campbell is like, you know what, if Mel Gibson in Braveheart on steroids and more Scottish, that, and more of an ass kicker, right? He's a serious ass kicker. Yeah, right? serious. Yeah, he kicked me once and made me sick. Wow. Literally kicked me and I had to go outside and get sick. And I was like, <laughs> how has my leg told my stomach to get sick? All right, and then I, yeah, I was dragging my foot behind me like yeah. a gangster for a week. I'd, I'd never want to get kicked by Ewan Campbell. No, Ewan, Ewan's brutal. But uh, it was down at the Rough and Ready gym in Northampton. Yeah. So I was, I took half a day at work. So I'll go, I pick up Mark at Ewan's. Right. We have a great chat on the way down. We're going we're gonna to do a couple of hours. It's going to be great. Ewan's going to pick him up. I'm going to drive down to Terry Barnett's and do the class. It's going to be great. Go down there. Basically, I walk into Terry Barnett's class, and this isn't, the, you know, the, it's just Mark is this good. So we work out, and I'm like, because literally I've just been stretched. So I'm like that, and then I've got, he actually got me to punch myself in my own eye, which if you've ever trained me on any of my seminars, you know where I teach all the kids at the end to be able to beat someone up with their own arm? That's what I, that's the <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, Rick Fay first taught me it. I call it the thousand dollar technique, parry and bridge, gargi, grab and bum. Uh, but it was Mark who showed me it. And I was like, it, it can't get any worse. Sure. You know, you're having a bad day when sure. you're punching yourself, yeah. but that's it. So with the Silat, how do you see that, that interconnect with the Wing Chun? Do you, do, do you make them, are they two separate entities? Like when you teach them, you teach them as two independent arts. Yeah, but you, absolutely. Where, yeah, but you see the overlaps. Oh, massive overlap. Massive overlap in CLAP for me and Wing Chun. So many of the techniques are almost identical. They just have different cultural names. So we might say uh, Sapu, which means foot sweep. In Wing Chun, we say Potgurk, 
or stamp kick. Yeah. You might say beset in Wing Chun. You might say lop gurk, back sweep. Yeah. Same techniques, just a different cultural origin, maybe a different reason why you're doing them. But for me, they work in perfect synergy. I yeah. teach classes and syllabus strictly separate, so you can come and do Wing Chun, or you could strictly come and do the Mande Muda, but in a practical sense, you should blend them. Uh, yeah, and do you teach so that it, you don't get this, for want of a better word, bastardization and mix? No, I, I used to do that. When I first started teaching, I didn't have so many classes and we just taught what I called JKD. So it was Kali, it was Sila, it was JKD, it was what Wing Chun I was doing at the time, all mixed into one, there was no delineation. But in the last sort of recent years, I've, I've gone back and I've, because of my interest in Wing Chun specifically, we've got separate programs for each art and they are taught by the numbers. Yeah, well you see, I, I actually think that's a better way. Okay, good. Uh, for, no, no, I do actually. And it's a, probably a contentious thing because there's more time involved in it. Mm. But when you just specifically look at something, you appreciate it. Sure. But then when it gets stuck in, as we said yeah. before, as our mutual teacher tells us, Speed and power, you can hide an awful lot sure. of a lack of understanding, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I've seen this a lot. You know, it's a, one of the things that's always amused me um, where people say, I do JKD too. Yeah. And I'm like, really? So you do jump and kickboxing? No, no, well, what I do is I do a bit of boxing, I do a bit of wrestling. And I went, mm. no, I don't, I sure. don't think so uh, because you know, it's unless you've gone into a specific area. And yeah, you know, again, because I just use this analogy because I'm a builder, right? Get good at being a bricklayer because there will be transferable arts to become a carpenter. Sure. But don't ever put a sign on your van saying that you're a carpenter. Yeah, sure. Yeah, until yeah. you turn around and then JKD is yeah. a general builder. Sure. Nine times out of ten, you know, you get overcharged. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, it sounds like martial arts, right? Doesn't. Uh, that's it. Are you, what, I, I thought you said you'd done my kitchen. You give me a bathroom instead. Oh, you look like you needed a bathroom more. You, you know what I'm <laughs> saying, right? So. This is the, not a shameless plug time, so I'm not, going to put you on okay. the, I'm not going to put you on the spot here. But if you wanted to train with you, what's the best way to contact you? And this is, this is the killer, right? This is a shameless plug, but I love it. Um, contact me through karasak.com or Co UK or Facebook. Just Facebook me, Paul Finn. That's the easiest way to get me. You see, what, one of the things that I do like about you, Paul, is because you... you just give exactly what you say, Yeah. right? No more, no less. Sure. This is what it's going to be. If you want to do bad MMA. You I'm like it person. or you don't like it, I'm straight. Yeah, and I'm still going to be I here. I teach Wing Chun and see that. That's what I do. I don't teach cage fighting. I don't profess to teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Thai boxing, any of those things. I teach Wing Chun, see that, Carly and JKD. And they're things I've got instructorships in, you know, I, for me, one of the big problems is seeing a lot of people out there, especially in the JKD world, with amazing qualifications teaching other arts. I never quite understand that. Well, it's the, it's the classic line again from Rick Fay, and I do love it because Rick says, I go to all these schools, I come back the next year, and like with me, I, you know, trust me, sure. Rick, first of all, it's my allegiance to you and I love you. And the fact that you've given me we the love syllabus. you, Rick. Rick, you've given me the syllabus that means I don't have to think, sure. which is what I love. You know, because this is a by the numbers. Because I'm not intelligent enough to be able to try and put something together. You know, these guys who are like, well, I've created mm. my own system. Mm. Oh, and you're yeah. like, hmm, interesting, mm. right? Mm. Uh, based on what? Mm. Yeah. Whereas, like, Guru Dan's, Guru Dan's done it for us. Sure. You know, Sifu Fong has done it for Yeah, us, yeah. exactly, which is like literally just follow this. Yeah. yeah, and basically it is it is as simple as this. Follow this by the numbers four times a week. That's it. The Graces and the Brazilians have done it for us with Jiu Jitsu. Exactly. Don't try and reinvent it. It's they, already been done. When was the last time you went to the doctor and he said, take this three times a day between before meals? And you go, do you know what? I'll have all eight now, sure. right? And But they do that. The problem is people do it. Of course they do it, especially in martial arts, because yeah. they're like, no, I want to be good now. Yeah. And it's like, uh, one thing I get is, how do I get to be as good as you? And I say, first of all, I'm not very good, <laughs> but the bar is low. 
Yeah, if you have been to Coventry, trust me, that's the one thing I always say, right? But more importantly, it's... I thought the bar was open with you. The bar is always open. <laughs> hey, it's five o'clock somewhere. But um, no, it's... I, I just really don't understand why people torture themselves sure. when they can get it yeah. for nothing. Sure. So, last question. Okay. You sat there. Hey, where do you want to go with your martial arts? Bear in mind, we're still sure, very young sure. men. Yeah, we still wear stussy t-shirts, man. Absolutely. Hey, High Paul's fun. the only guy I know in martial arts that still wears stussy like me, man. We kill it. Yeah, we kill it. Right, but where where's the future? Because obviously you're the wrong side of forty, like myself, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Where's the future in martial arts for you? Future in martial arts, I think. For you. For me. Yeah. I want to grow with Sifu Fong's organisation. Um, Francis Fong Instructors Association, which I'm a big part of. I want to try and um, I really, I've really had this this thing where I'm trying to get Wing Chun and Silat out to the masses in the UK. Proper Wing Chun and proper Silat, even though I'm sure people have criticised me for saying that. But I want people to understand that it is practical, even if you keep it traditional. And it was the last question, but you okay. can expand on this. Okay. Why is there so much politics? Do you know what? That's a really interesting question. I saw your interview before with um, Randy, Sifu, Randy Williams. Yeah. yeah, great interview. Um, Thank you. I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of vested interest in people making commercial Wing Chun schools. There's a lot of money involved in Wing Chun. We were talking about... Um, some very famous Wing Chun practitioners earlier who are very successful and have made multi-million pound businesses Serious money. out of Wing Chun. People who live in castles, you know, I know Wing Chun guys in the UK who I grew up with and one or two of them, I won't name them, but they know who they are. They've got 60 schools, three, four thousand students. Um, that, that, that's crazy numbers. Yeah, they've got that. That, you know, that's crazy. You know, we talk about JK, these guys have got thousands of students. And there's a commercial element there. So I'm sure everybody says my seafood's the best seafood. There's a, obviously, you know, it, it's a business for some people. But I think you've got to look at the lineage. Where does your, your Wing Chun come from? Can you trace it back to people like Yip Man? Can you trace it back to seafoods like Sifu Fong or Ju Wan? If you're saying my Sifu is a guy called Mark who learned a bit off a guy called Jason in a church hall down in Birmingham who once went to China on his holiday, then, then perhaps that lineage isn't quite what you want. Well, you see, this is, uh, this, and this, this is one of my favourites. I've met so many guys who are black belts, and then you say, so who did you get your black belt from? And he went, it was this guy, I can't remember his name. name yeah. And you're like... So you were with a guy for four years and he punched you in the head every week and you can't remember his name, really? Sure. Uh, you, I, I'm sorry, we, we have to stick with this. You said something very telling there, right? With Wing Chun, you addressed the, the Sifu and the Sifu was still held, held in very high regard. Absolutely. Very, very high regard. Yeah. And I Tradition, think, yeah, and heritage. I, and I think, I, yeah, w when it's deserved, I think that's great. Great. But when I think it's when I think it's not deserved, I think it's cultish. You know. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I I sometimes not. Yeah, I'm not just going to say Wing Chun, but I see it in a lot of martial arts where I look at these guys and I'm thinking, you guys are literally shaving your head and buying a pair of sure. purple Nikes sure. away from a cult. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it is crazy, right? And I think that's one of the things that's held us back in the JKD family because what we've done is we've always put the onus on the individual yep. and we'll help you. Mm -hmm. But like in, yeah, a guiding hand, whereas in most martial arts, it's like you go that way or you're out. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's trying to work out, as you mentioned earlier, with Sifu Francis's organization. Yep. I know Rick Faye's doing the same. Guru Dan has it to a degree, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously with the help of Alan Baker, how, Eric Paulson, yeah. where it's so structured now. Sure. You know, it, I think that was one of the things where before, we've never ever been in a time in the world where information is so accessible. Absolutely. Yeah, you want the next... When we first started the martial arts, 
you wanted the first technique, you had to go training the next week, or you had to go to a course somewhere. Yeah. You had to do this. Like JKD, yeah, most of us found out about JKD by reading Rick Young's travel logs in combat. Absolutely. That's yeah. how it yeah. worked, right? Yeah. And now what do we do? We just go on YouTube, yeah, sure. find out that yeah. that's how it works. So I, I really think with the, with the JKD, I think we, we've still got another 10 years to try and get that structure mm. together. But you know, those numbers you were talking about, uh, do you know what, I'm thinking about starting, uh, if you want to train with Mick Tully in original Wing Chun in Coventry, uh, you know, I met this guy once. No, I can't really do that, can I? But no, that's crazy numbers. Sure. Uh, but those guys, those, those guys have had those numbers for 20 years. They just keep it very low key. I, I know a guy who had his Wing Chun gradings at Crystal Palace more than 15 years ago. I can't get the numbers correct, but we're talking about three, four hundred people took the grading. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and that, that was, well, yeah, obviously a five or a head or something, right? That, yeah. Uh, no, no, but you know what I'm saying, right? No, you have to pay for a weekend course, you have to, you know. That's it, that's I, it. I think the problem, you know, JKD is a very different flavour. You were talking about the relaxedness of it. I think in some ways a lot of the JKD guys now we've almost got to kind of not reinvent it but just bring it back under control because it's almost a bit I even in my group there's a distinct difference between the people who take my Wing Chun program and the people who do my JKD program and my JKD guys are like oh the Wing Chun's too regimented and the Wing Chun guys are the JKD is a bit too freewheeling, freewheeling. Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah you see this is my my take is uh, I actually went back to my old karate instructor, right, Andy Margaret, great guy, right, uh, went back, taught uh, a portion on a charity seminar, so I just went in and I just, like, Pah! I just blasted through, you know what I mean, I was just doing, the, I, I, I'm good at about four things, and that's all I ever do, trust me, I, I, honestly, I, I, yeah, I'm like Anton De Beat, you know, from Strictly Come yeah, Dancing, yeah, sure. he's only good at waltzes, okay. like that's me, right. I'm only good at that and nothing else, right, but it was the, the lining up and the standing there, no talking, the whole lot. And I love Andy. Andy was a guy who put me on the, he put me on the road, right? And I go in there and I'm joking around and, you know, I walk past and you know, mm. pinch one of the guys on the bum as I'm walking past the trains with me just for fun. And Andy was like, you've got worse. Mm. Because I, I never wanted to be part of that. Sure. And I, you know, I have a, we, we bow in, we bow mm. out. Mm -hmm. You bow every time you change partners. Sure. But I don't enforce that. Sure. Yeah, that's something you should choose to do. Yeah. And if they don't want to do it, then they don't last very long. Yeah. Well, it's know? like the Wing Chun, you know. A lot of guys say, oh, they come in and they go, I just want to do the trapping. So they want to trap and hit pads. Or Sifu Fong's told me many times people come to him and they say, I just want to learn the wooden dummy. What people need to understand is Wing Chun is a complete art. And I think this is what's been lost a lot by a number of people. Um, they specialise. So you'll get guys specialising in Qi Sao or guys specialising in sparring. But if you look at Wing Chun, it's a system. I don't recreate the system. I've been taught by Sifu Francis Fong, Sifu Joseph Lee, People who've got a lineage directly to Yip Man, to people like uh, Li Xing and Ju Wan. I don't create the system. The system is there. If you stick with the system, it's a system. It would be like trying to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and saying, well, I'm only going to fight on the floor. I don't want any throws. I don't want any takedowns. I don't want any wrist locks. We're just going to fight on the floor. Well, how did you get to the floor? You've got to have everything. It's like the forms. Guys, some guys come, they don't want to learn the forms. If you don't learn the forms, you don't start to appreciate the motion, you don't take it seriously, you can't get the sensitivity. It's a package, you can't pick and choose. Yeah, but you see, you know, you've just hit the nail on the head. It's like, people, what, what is it? Is it just preference? Is it the fact that they might be crap at that portion? Which I... Is, I think you're right. Which I, I always it's preference, see. Yeah. I, and then, I, I, I always think to myself, but... You know, first of all, it's like Guru Danny in Asanto always says, don't take this ability you've got as yours. You're a custodian of this. Sure. And I, I love the way he says it, because he always says, you're a custodian of the art, and the ability, you're a, you're a custodian, because the way you move at 50 isn't the way you move to 20. Absolutely. And it isn't the way, and Absolutely. it doesn't have to diminish that sure. much. 
because he's proven this, right? But the art, again, is if you want, you know, so many people want to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. So many people want to change the world. Yep. And these are the same people who can't change their underpants. Sure. And you're like, wait a minute, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're, a, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, uh, and it, again, it makes me sit, seem like a fanboy, but I think Guru Dan in Osanto is the only real genius I've ever met. I've met a load of people connected to him that, you know, there's, I believe in osmosis somewhere along the line. You know what I mean? Because even the guys that really you didn't think were going to get it, got some of it. You know sure. what I mean, right? But it's like, why are you trying to second get? It's like Albert Einstein being your physics teacher. Sure. And then saying, have you ever thought about looking at yeah. it this way, yeah. Albert? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, you know, is there any chance you could brush your hair at the same sure. time? You know, it's like, get out of here. You guys are clowns, man. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we live in interesting times, as they we say, do. in China, yeah, man. Yeah, you know? So I've been waiting to get that one in. Right, Paul, again. It's been a pleasure, If you man. get the chance. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. If you get the chance, please, yeah, you've got to look him up because, again, Paul, Ralph Jones, I think are criminally, criminally under, uh, overlooked in this country. Uh, and, again, it's uh, one of the reasons is because that's what you offer. And it's like, if, it's, if there's 100 people there or there's 10 people there, Sure. That's all I'm gonna. That's what I'm teaching, right? I, I said to Sifu Fong earlier today, there's ten people there, one person there. I'll still teach. That, yeah, but, yeah, but that's a, yeah, but that's the thing, you know. Yeah. That's what we do. We teach, right? Uh, exactly that. The other one I always say is when I use this personally for myself, is I, I can only sing my way, you know. And the, the the Sinatra song, I don't really sing it that well. But what I'm saying is, I, don't try and get me to sing something yeah. else. I'm not good at Taylor Swift. Right, you don't know who Taylor Swift is. Oh. Why am I getting guys like this on my show? Yeah, you do, don't you? Of course I do. Yeah. But it's good to wind you up. Better believe it. Thanks, man. Yeah, painless, wasn't Sorry. it? Painless. Told you. Now, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Will. He's yeah. good, isn't he? Very good.